Well, hello everyone, and welcome back to yet another hand breakdown from High Stakes Poker. If you've been enjoying this series and the hand breakdowns, let me know down below. I do check out the comments, you know, as much as I can when they re release it first. And, you know, you guys seem to be, from what I'm gathering, really enjoying the content. And for those of you that uh, are yet to have a Poker Go subscription, we've talked about this. This is a must. You have to get the subscription so that you can watch shows like High Stakes Poker and the like. So, highly recommend doing that, okay? Also, if you want this t-shirt, check this out. It's got Balboa, Creed, Clubber, Drago, the hairstyles, right? He <laughs> contendersclothing.com. There's a promo code. I don't know what it is. He does. So we're going to go with that. Okay. So you guys remember one of the previous videos. We had a big call against Garrett where we check, check to the river with two tens. And then we snapped off a bluff, won a nice pot. You know, Garrett, if you've watched this season has been very unlucky. Like he's just been running into a lot of really tough, brutal spots. So, you know, you have to take that into account in terms of someone's mental state before you play a hand. But this is a guy who's tough. You know, he's got he got cojones, he's got guts, and he's, you know, he's, 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 he's going to keep it even keel. So I'm not going to think that, like, just because things have been going, you know, against him that he's going to all of a sudden go on tilt specifically. However, he's going to continue to play his game, which is an aggressive game. And we're going to talk about that on this hand right here. Tilly's involved, raises the 3,000 with jack seven of spades. Jennifer can't wait to get back in action. Daniel's going to four bet to 27,000. Daniel in his Obi-Wan Kenobi poker <laughs> sweatshirt. <laughs> And Ivy says, I have ace-queen, but I'm not going to give any looks. I'm just going to throw it away. Will Garrett go in for 16,000 more with a 9-10 suited? What do you say? Guy plays good. I say yes. There you go. And you are right. He'll play really good if some diamonds come out there. Aces and queens are going to be hard to come by. Now, blinds are 500 and 1,000 with a dead $1,000 big blind ante. Okay. So it comes to Jennifer Tilly, and she raises to 3,000 with a jack seven of spades. Fine. Cool. Now, Adelstein three bets to 11K from the cutoff with the nine, ten of diamonds. Now, here's the thing. If you've been watching the season or you were playing, you'd see this was coming up a lot. Anytime Jennifer Tilly opened... If Garrett had any kind of hand that sort of was decent to play post-flop, he was in there three-betting her to isolate, right? He wanted to play, especially with the stack depths, you know, Tilly's sitting on about 300,000. He wants to play in position because he feels like he can use that advantage to, uh, you know, pick up pick up equity, right, against Jennifer, who he feels maybe will be a little more predictable post-flop or whatever the case may be, right? So obviously, I'm sitting next to Garrett. So while Garrett is picking on Jen, right, I know that, so as a result, I get to pick on him. So now, a hand where, let's say, in the old days, right, in the late 90s, early 2000s, if someone raised and someone re-raised and you had ace-queen, <laughs> you wouldn't put a chip in the pot. You'd just run away, right? Games evolve, new situation, new scenario. As I said, you factor all those things up, right? Jennifer's not a professional. Garrett is. He's isolating. And I'm in position and we're hella deep, Right? I'm sitting on 372. That's 372 big blinds. He's got more. Jennifer's got about 300. So now I pick up this ace queen. I, I pick up on what's happening in this scenario. And so, of course, I'm going to throw in some four bets, right? And I'm going to throw in some four bets with some suited connectors and different types of hands um, with value. But ace queen, certainly, you know, I don't really want to flat a three bet here. You know, you don't want to like allow him to realize whatever equity he has with whatever hand he three bet with. So this is a spot where... I really like a four bet, which is exactly what I did. Now the question is, what size, right? Well, because my four bet range should be pretty polarized here, should be in theory, you don't have to go so big in position, right? So he made it 11x, I'm making it 27. That's different than what it would look like if I was in the small blind. If I was in the small blind uh, and he made it 11, I'm probably going to something closer to like 35, 40,000, something in that neighborhood. Um... 
So yeah, I make it 27 full, and I fully expect at that price that he's going to call. Like I'm not four betting with the, like thinking he's folding a ton. I do think he's really wide. I think I have the be- the better hand. Uh, my hand my hand is well ahead of his three betting range in this specific scenario. So just for the value of ace queen, I'm happy to play a flop in position against what is predominantly going to be a weaker hand, right? So he does call, and now we've got sixty thousand in the pot. Okay. Bye. No diamonds here. But a nine. Mm-hmm. And a check. And as one tap dancer says to the other tap dancer, take it. <laughs> and here he goes. 20 grand from Daniel. Garrett pondering. And he's going to call. Now the flop comes. King of clubs, nine of clubs, four of spades. I don't have anything. I don't have a club. Okay, I don't have the ace of clubs. I don't have the queen of clubs. I've got no spades for back door. I'm just sitting there with the old ace queen, right? But he checks, and this is going to be a decent flop for a four betting range that is value, right? Because what does a four betting range look like that's value? Aces, kings, queens, jacks, tens maybe, a little bit. Ace, king, right? And a little bit of ace, queen thrown in there, right? But that's not the value. That's the bluff. So ace, king, so that's a good flop for me, okay? In terms of when we're thinking about it from a perspective of who range versus range, right? And I remember we've talked about this. When every time a flop comes out, you want to think about, all right, Who's that flop better for based on how we played the pre-flop? That flop's going to be better for me, which means I'm going to bet it a high percentage of the time, which is what I do here for about third pot. We bet 20,000. Now Garrett calls, okay? I expected him to call a decent amount here. I don't expect him to just be calling and folding, you know, on that flop. I thought that he's going to have a lot of spots where he's going to have just a gutter, right, which ace-queen beats anyway. He's going to have a nine. He's going to have a king sometimes too. He's going to have some pocket pairs that peel, right? Like, look, if he has two tens, for example, I don't think he's just going to check fold because the king came. So still a whole bunch of hands that he can have, especially because I priced it in such a way where all those hands, like, are kind of forced to continue, right? When I bet 20,000, he pretty much has to. So again, I wasn't betting the 20,000 with the expectation that, oh, I'm going to bet this 20 and be done, right? That's a waste. Like, if you're playing pots where you're c-betting and you're c-betting with small sizes and you don't have any intention of following that up with further bluffs, you're just burning money against a lot of players. You're just burning it, you know? It's a waste. You might as well just check and give up if you're going to do that, right? Why below the 20,000? But I had plans, so. Seven of diamonds. Daniel looks like he's on top of this hand. He's got a really good opinion of where Garrett is at. Probably putting him on a nine. That would be my guess. Yeah, that's 50,000. Nines don't cut it around here, son. Also could be putting Garrett on a flush draw. Jennifer says, this is kind of interesting. Wow. How about that? I'm impressed. Mm -hmm. Turn card is a seven of diamonds, totally insequential, right? What does that really help with? I guess it helps with one specific hand, the 10 jack, right? Because now the 10 jack turns from a gut shot to an open end straight draw. Having said that, and and look, can he have 10 jack? Absolutely. Maybe even unsuited because I made it so small. Probably not. I think he folds jack 10 off, but I can't imagine a world where he's folding jack 10 suited. Just never. Not for the sizing. Okay? Especially with the stack depth that we have. So he checks, and now, you know, the question is, do I give up? Hope that my ace-queen uh, has showdown value, which is still a possibility against the 10 jacks and these different types of hands. Or do I use this hand as a bluff? Okay? I elect to use this hand as a bluff. Part of the reason is I block ace-king. I block aces. I also, most importantly, I block king-queen suited 
and some king queen offs, right? Those are all hands that he could certainly have where because I have those hands, uh, he can't. The more important thing though is that I don't have the ace of clubs or don't have the queen of clubs. You might be thinking, well, isn't it good to have that hand? Because then, you know, he's more less likely to make a flush. Well, no, because if you have the ace of clubs or the queen of clubs, that makes it less likely that he has a flush draw, right? Which would continue. So, th- and that's going to play, that's going to that's gonna show some importance on the river, right? So not blocking the clubs, that's a good, that's a good thing because I, 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 it increases the chances that he has a flush draw. If he has a flush draw, I got the best hand, right? If you look at the board, the king and the nine are the clubs. So if he's got a flush, if he's got ace of clubs with another club, unless it's exactly ace queen that we chop, um, but any flush draw he would have, like the queen, ten of clubs, queen, I'm still ahead of that. So I go ahead and I bet half pot, 50,000 into the hundred. Okay? Nothing there. Check. There's a check. Will Daniel fire that third bullet? And will Garrett be Mr. Sticky? Here goes the third bullet. Here it comes. $175,000. Wow. I have to say that Daniel has really elevated his game. I think he's been playing some poker since the last few seasons <laughs> yeah, of high stakes poker. Yeah, I think he's <laughs> spent some time at the poker table. A little golf in there, too. This is a great play, and it would be an incredible call if Garrett makes it. Now the river is the three of diamonds. It's not a complete brick, but pretty much a brick. brick. What, what hand does it really connect with? The one, literally one, the five, six of clubs, okay? Again, possible. I probably don't have it, but he could. So you have to think about that a little bit, right? Not overly concerned with the five, six of clubs. I think, you know, some of the times he's going to check. Well, no, maybe not. Yeah, never mind. But yeah, I mean, it's a very small consideration. Anyway, now the pot is 200,000, okay? He's checked. In this spot, as I said, I, I don't block the flush draw. So he could, I could have just the best hand. Like I could just check back here and hope that he missed 10 jack, queen, 10 of clubs, something like that, or ace something of clubs, and my ace queen's good, right? But ask yourself this. In this spot, when I four bet, 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 I have to have some bluffs, right? You, you have to understand in theory, when you play poker, you can't always be in situations where you only would bet here with the nuts and you don't have any bluffs in your range, right? So what bluffs are better than the one that I have, right? The one, the one downside of, of this as a bluff is it has showdown value. Like, I could just win the pot. Probably, I mean, it's a slim chance, right? You know, it's just against those flush draws. But, um, you know, I'm losing to just any stubborn nine, all the king X, whatever the case may be, right? So now if you think about what hands I'm forbetting with that are worse than ace-queen here, ace-jack maybe, okay? Queen jack suited, 10 jack, some of those hands, sure, I might do that with, but ace queen's pretty low in terms of like when you think of the entirety of my range that four bets, bets one third on flop, bets half on turn, and then bombs river for almost pot, right? So all the values there, except for I don't have queens anymore, right? We know that I don't have queens when I bet the turn. Like I'm not betting queens on this turn. I'm not betting jacks on this turn. I'm not betting tens on this turn. That's going to be a check back. So my value range is actually quite limited. But at the same time, so are my bluffs, right? But you got to have some. And ace-queen certainly falls into a category, I think, that makes a lot of sense to use as a bluff in this spot. What am I, what is, what am I repping here for this size? Really, I'm repping ace-king or better. That's it, right? Well, there's a decent amount of that. I mean, I guess I could have pocket nines. Pete has a nine. Well, that, that's, I didn't know he had a nine, but like, anyway, pocket nines maybe. Pocket kings could have. Pocket aces for sure, right? Ace king for sure. Like all those hands I can have, and uh, but that's it, right? Like you know, I mean, I guess. Well, am I gonna do that with king nine suited? Probably not. I'm not. I'm not looking to get too cray cray at that stack depth. So that's literally my value range, which was in a ton, right? But then, like, look at my bluffs. There's not a lot. And ace queen certainly not value. It has very thin showdown value, 
but it is a hand that I think is probably one of the better hands to turn into a bluff. Well, to just actually don't even turn, it's a bluff, right? Huh, I don't know. This is really a great hand. Mm -hmm. When no one talks, you can tell. Show the buff. Oh, there's some hand. <clears throat> wow. Show the buff. Shit. Dwan had a feeling. Show the bluff. Come <laughs> <Shit>. on. <laughs> Want me to show bluffs? Is that what we're doing over here? Come on, man. You know you're welcome to. I'm not the guy who'd be annoyed if you did. I'm sure you know. I know, of course. Yeah, I know you're yeah. into that. But that was pretty intense. It'd be fun. You guys got My off. thought process was that I might get him off a king here, right? That was the goal, potentially. Considering how long he took with just the nine, I guess that plan probably would not have worked. I think he probably would have called me with a king. But anyway, I hope that you understand here the importance of figuring out in each spot, ask yourself, when you're in spots, you're like, all right, in this spot, I would bet with a lot of really, really good hands, what hands would I bluff with, right? And you gotta make sure you do, right? Because if you don't bluff in these spots, after a while, your opponents just never call you and you're not gonna get the value that you should, especially if you're playing in cash games, right? You have to be a little bit more balanced. You don't have to be purely balanced, right? If you have guys you play with that, you know, they just always call you or whatever, all right, they don't, don't bother bluffing. But it's still worthwhile to show a few here and there so that uh, they continue to do so, right? Because after a while, if you never bluff and they keep calling, they're like, this guy, man. <laughs> Maybe they will start folding, which is not what you want. So this ace-queen hand was an important one in that you, I didn't dog it. You know, I think the old me, for sure, old school Dean eggs, would never have got myself in this situation. I may have four bet, sure. Probably, you know, maybe bet that flop. But I probably didn't have in my old school repertoire the, you know, mindset of bluff it off, bluff it off, turn and river. And I was honestly comfortable. If he would have called and had a king, I'm like, okay, this is where you got to get to sometimes in poker. It's like, all right, if he called there, nothing to be upset about. If he called with a king, it's just, I played my hand. The, the hand played itself, this is what you do with the ace-queen, right? Once you can start detaching from that emotional connection, and that's probably one of the harder things for me, going from the style of poker that I played, which was the limit hold'em style, which is very value bet, value bet, value bet, value bet, very little bluffing, you're not taking huge risks, to understanding that big bluffs are just sometimes coolers, right? If he would have happened to have a king there, oh well, you know, I, and called, I, it's kind of like a cooler, because I was at like pretty much the bottom of my range, and in those spots, those are the kind of hands you want to bluff with. So hope you enjoyed that one. It's been kind of a spicy season as uh, the blinds go up and there's more big pots to come. Some of them, I'm not, well, I'd say some of them I'm not involved in, but there is one coming between yours truly, Phil Ivey, and Patrick Antonius that we will talk about and might blow y'all minds because it blew mine. Anyways, y'all, hope you enjoyed the breakdown. Many more to come. Mm -hmm.